and welcome to Reedy's online service. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Today in the Christian church's calendar is known as Palm Sunday, the day in which we remember Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, of course, there's a lot more deeper meaning to that than just the event itself, and we're going to look at that in just a moment. But thank you for being with us here again this morning. I want to open up in a word of prayer. I want to pray particularly for the continuing situation in the Ukraine and other areas of the world. Would you please pray with me? Oh, Father God, on this day, on this Palm Sunday, a day in which we remember you coming into Jerusalem where people came out cheering Jesus on and saying, Hosanna, which means save me, save me. And yet we look around the world today and there's still people crying out, save me, save me. Father God, we pray for the people in the Ukraine, Lord. Again, there was senseless bombings on that train station just a couple of days ago. And Lord, it just brings us complete and utter sadness and grief and anguish as we see so many innocent lives being slaughtered like this. Lord, we pray for this senseless uh, war will come to an end, Lord. We just pray you just give calm heads to our world leaders, Lord. I pray, Father God, that you'll be with those people in the Ukraine and other areas around the world where it's been torn apart by war and persecution. Father God, on this Palm Sunday, we do remember how you came in peace, but you came also knowing that a few days' time you were going to die on the cross for humanity. So, Father God, as we open up your word now, I pray you may speak into our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We are going through the Gospel of John, particularly looking at the unique sections that are only mentioned by John and not the other three Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark and Luke. Today we are looking at a prayer of Jesus where he prays for us. Now, the context of this prayer helps us to understand the significance of it, particularly for us. See, just a few days earlier, Jesus entered Jerusalem on a young donkey. Let's look from John's perspective for what happened on that day. It's found in John chapter 12. We read that there was a great crowd who had come to Jerusalem for the annual Passover and they heard that Jesus was coming to town and so they went out to meet him. This crowd had witnessed some of Jesus' miraculous signs. But then John says in verse 13, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. Now palm branches were used in celebration of a victory. And then John says that they were shouting Psalm 118, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And then Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as the crowd cheered on. But to the disciples, they were confused by what was happening, according to verse 16. They didn't understand why Jesus had to come to Jerusalem knowing that something bad could happen to him. They couldn't understand fully the palm branches and the chanting. And then John says, only after Jesus was glorified did they realise that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. We now call this Palm Sunday which happens to be today. It was a significant way in which Jesus entered into Jerusalem. You see, Jerusalem was always Jesus' destination. Just before his entry, Luke wrote in chapter 9, verse 51, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Why? Well, Matthew wrote, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But why Jerusalem? Well, Jesus gives us a clue in Luke 13 verse 33 when he said, Yes, today, tomorrow 
and the next day I must proceed on my way, for it wouldn't do for a prophet of God to be killed except in Jerusalem. You see, it was in Jerusalem that many of the prophets died. It was also in Jerusalem that all the trials of the prophets took place before the Sanhedrin. And so Jesus knew this. And so he resolutely set out for Jerusalem and he organized a parade. But why a parade? Why couldn't he just simply walk in like everyone else would have? Jesus knew that his time had come. He deliberately planned for this special parade. His, his plan was to force the Jewish leaders to act, to begin plotting his death. Jesus' earthly ministry was nearly completed. He had equipped his disciples to continue the ministry. He pointed many to God through his teachings, healings and miracles. And now he had to die to establish the new covenant, to create hope and destiny for his followers and to usher in the new movement. By marching now, Jesus knew that this would incite the Jewish leaders to act upon killing him. This parade put the icing upon the cake, so to speak, when they saw the great crowds that had gathered cheering him on. John recorded that the Pharisees became increasingly frustrated and that they went away and plotted how they were going to kill him. This entry into Jerusalem commenced a week that would change the world. Over the next few days, Jesus made final preparations for his death, which involved some final teachings, including washing the disciples' feet. That's in chapter 13. And then Jesus comforts them by teaching them about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit will come upon them after he had gone. That's in chapter 14. In chapter 15, still on this same night, he spoke to them about how necessary it was for them to remain in him like branches on a vine so that they can bear much fruit. Most of this happened on the Thursday night of this significant week. We are then told that Jesus went off to pray. So the context of this prayer is that any moment Jesus was going to be betrayed, arrested, put on trial, and then crucified. These last moments were incredibly important to him. He had forced the leaders to organize how they were going to kill him, and he had spent time with his disciples saying some of these last words to them. Now it was his time to be with his father. And we are given a special privileged insight into what he prayed. That's the context of his prayer, which is found in chapter 17. And this is our focus this morning. Reading through Christ's prayer, we really get an insight of what was utmost on his heart. There are three main points that Jesus prayed for. One was for protection for his followers. Next was for his followers to be sanctified. And the other was for unity amongst his followers. Protection, sanctification and unity. Jesus knew that his followers, and that includes all of us who follow him today, he knew that his followers were going to be on mission in a world that would be hostile to them and their message because of him. We see it now in our country where politicians and journalists and many other lobby groups are voicing their views against the Christian faith. Across the centuries and around the world, hostilities towards Christianity have been and are far more intense. So no wonder Jesus prayed for protection, unity and sanctification for his followers. After Jesus prays for his glorification so that God will be glorified, Jesus turns his attention towards us and starts praying for our protection. He prayed in verse 11, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me. And Jesus prayed this again in verse 15. 
My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you will protect them from the evil one. Jesus has sent us into the world. He commanded us to be his salt and light of the world. His desire is that we will remain in places of employment and study and leisure and be his witnesses. But he knew of the opposition that we will face, particularly from the, from the main person, the opposer himself, the evil one. And so Jesus prayed for the protection of, of our faith, that we would not be tempted and snatched away from the deceiver. And this ought to be our prayer too. Too many have been snatched away. We need to watch each other's back. It is as if Jesus knew that a, a major strategy of the devil is to divide and conquer. And Jesus prays this next point for us. Look at verses 21 to 23. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus prayed this because he knew that Satan loves division. If the devil can divide us, he can conquer us. When we feed disunity, we give Satan a foothold. The dictionary defines foothold as a secure position from which further progress may be made. And when we feed disunity, we give the devil a secure position from which he can make further progress in dividing the church. This is why Paul says, do not give the devil a foothold. Thomas Manton, an English Puritan minister from the 16th century, has written, Divisions in the church always breed atheism in the world. That's why the devil loves disunity. The early church at Corinth had its problems. And so Paul tells them, let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Unfortunately, it appears that they didn't listen to Paul's instructions. St. Clement of Rome wrote to this same church around 20 to 30 years later and just ripped into them. It's one of the earliest pieces of writings that we have about the church outside of the, Old, outside of the New Testament. Clement tells them, Why is it that you harbour strife and bad temper, dissension and quarrelling? Do we not have one God, one Christ, one Spirit of grace which was poured out on us your split has led many astray it had many in despair yet it goes on wow i mean i've been to corinth no church exists there anymore gone satan got a foothold he divided and conquered them that's why jesus prayed for us that we would be united we can't allow the devil to get a foothold. However, because of who we are and how we allow sin to creep into our lives, we still have our imperfections. We will step on each other's toes. We will say things that will upset one another. And so I see why Jesus also prayed for us to be sanctified. This is the next point that Jesus prayed for us. Look at verses 17 to 19. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctified myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. The more sanctified we become, the less chance of disunity forming. Jesus considered 
sanctification so important that he prayed for it he prayed for us to be sanctified and the apostle paul under the inspiration of the holy spirit wrote to the church at thessalonica and saying this may god himself the god of peace sanctify you through and through because Jesus prayed that we may be truly sanctified, and Paul writing that he wanted God to sanctify us completely, we better know what Jesus was praying for and what Paul was hoping for, so that if there's anything we need to do about it, then we better know how to do it. So sanctification originates from a Greek word which means to be separate or to be set apart in the Bible, sanctification generally relates to a sovereign act of God where he sets apart a person, a place, or a thing in order that his purposes might be accomplished. God has sanctified places of worship, and even the seventh day was sanctified. The Bible teaches that not only are buildings and days sanctified, set apart for special purposes, but so too are God's people. As God's children, we are set apart for a special purpose. Back to that passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. And the purpose, why? Well, Paul continues in that verse. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so sanctification is a, process, is a process where at that moment of conversion, we are sanctified, set apart, ready for that day when Jesus comes back. But here's the thing about sanctification. It does not stop with salvation when we become Christians, but rather it is a progressive process that continues throughout our Christian life. However, because we have the capacity to sin, that we will behave in ways that will give the devil a foothold leading to disunity or worse. And so sanctification is like a process that continues to work within us to be more like Jesus, that builds up the church ready for that day when he returns. Sanctification is like a chisel that continues to carve away stuff from us, forming us to be more holy. You see... From the very beginning, God has always had a plan, and his plan is to make us more like his son, Jesus Christ. His plan is to put into your life the very character traits of Christ. The great sculptor Michelangelo was once asked, how did you sculpt the famous David? And he said, well, I just chip away everything that didn't look like David. It was as simple as that. And that's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. He just continues to chip away everything in our character that doesn't look like Jesus Christ. He's chipping away everything in my character, all the character faults and character flaws that don't look like Jesus Christ, because his plan is to make me more like Jesus Christ, ready for that day when he returns. And one of the main roles of the Holy Spirit is to sanctify us. Peter reminds us of this in his first letter when referring to us being saved, and he also wrote through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that keeps chipping away at us. We all face difficult issues, struggle with sin, and past hurts of varying degrees that hinder our ability to live life that God desires for us. Once we accept Jesus Christ into our lives, the Holy Spirit enters and starts a transformation, a process called sanctification. The Holy Spirit convicts us on areas that needs to be changed, helping us to grow in holiness. We begin to view the world, people and personal difficulties from a more biblical perspective. Our choices begin to be motivated by love and truth and not selfishness. The transformation process may be painful, but it's always motivated by God's love for us. With sanctification, we are to pursue it. The writer of Hebrews said, Work at living a holy life for those 
who are not holy will not see the Lord. Jesus prayed that we would be sanctified by his word in verse 17. You need to work at regularly reading the Bible. God's word will chip away at us, encouraging and challenging us and moulding us into who we are to be. And Paul adds to how to work at being holy or at sanctification. He says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 to 14, But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called when you made your good confessions in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you choose to pursue sanctification in your life the devil can't get a foothold it takes time and you are to work and you are a work in progress but the more you are sanctified the greater the unity with one another and the more protected your faith will be when jesus christ entered jerusalem on palm sunday an incredible week followed how privileged we are to have insights into what was on Christ's heart just prior to his betrayal, arrest, trials and death. We see his heart for our protection, unity and sanctification. Our response is to be a part of our Saviour's prayer by pursuing sanctification. Let's pray. Father God, on that Palm Sunday, you came into Jerusalem, which incited the Jewish leaders to act, to plot your death. And yet just prior to your death, just prior to your arrest, you spent time in prayer for us. You prayed for us, even though you were just about to face death. Thank you, Jesus, for praying for our protection, sanctification, and unity. Continue, Lord, the process of sanctification in our lives. Keep chipping away at us, Lord. Help us to pursue it. Father God, thank you for this most significant week. I pray that you'll help us to be spiritually prepared for this most holy week, the week in which you died and rose again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.